এখন শুরু করি ফাংশনাল নিউরো সার্জারি কারেন্ট অ্যান্ড ফিউচার ডাইরেকশনস ওয়ে আর উই গোয়িং ওয়ান অফ দ্য কোয়েশ্চেনস ইজ ওয়াই হ্যাজ ইট টেকেন সো লং টু কাম টু বাংলাদেশ বাট ইউ সি আই হ্যাভ সিন বাংলাদেশ নিউরো সার্জারি ফ্রম দ্য টাইম when the only neurosurgical service for Bangladesh was Professor Rashid Juma flying in to Dhaka once a month to offer his services. So there was nothing here. And then when I went to medical school and visited again, there were four neurosurgeons. There was Rashid, uh, there was Professor Borua and two others. Four neurosurgeons for uh, over 100 million people. So functional neurosurgery was a luxury that had to save lives. And now, 25 years later, Bangladesh has reached a position where you are self-sufficient in general neurosurgery. So you can move on to look at other uh, aspects of neurosurgery like I do, which is restoration of function, not saving lives. It's not a heroic surgery. But I'd like to share with you what fascinates me. I first went to uh, university not to study medicine, but to study the neuromuscular junction of a group of animals called the nematode, because they only have 350 neurons in their brain. And I thought by understanding uh, the nematode brain, I could understand the human one. The definition of functional neurosurgery is a branch of neurosurgery that utilizes dedicated structural and functional imaging to identify and target discrete areas of the brain and to perform specific interventions, whether you use ablation, neurostimulation, neuromodulation, transplantation, or others, using dedicated instruments and machinery in order to relieve a variety of neurological and other disorders and to improve function of both the structurally normal and abnormal nervous system. So that's what we do. The origins of functional neurosurgery. First of all, we had to understand the brain. We had to localize brain function, which started in the 1800s when Broca describe the speech area. Having done that, one has to understand neuroanatomy of the brain. And there were many tools that were developed. Sectioning, using a microscope, staining cells were the original tools. To precisely place lesions to study brain function, we needed a frame. We had to learn how to lesion and how to stimulate brain areas, and also how to record from brain cells. And to understand disease, we had to learn to use animals so that we could understand brain function. Frisch and Hitzig, this is Frisch and Hitzig, they started localizing brain function, identifying the motor cortex. During the Crimean War, when soldiers were lying on the battle floor with parts of their skull blown away in, by bullets, and they would stimulate areas of the brain to look at what, where brain function was. Hewlings Jackson was in charge of a hospital for the disabled, and he studied the progression of epilepsy to show that um, a fit that started in the uh, face could spread to the arm, to spread to the leg, to become generalized. And use that, localizing it with brain abnormalities, to also localize brain function. And Ferrier extensively used the monkey model to excise areas of the brain to establish localization. To understand neuroanatomy, central to understanding the brain, Kahal, using Golgi stains, was able to show that the brain was made up of individual neurons because in those days it was not clear in the 18th century, 19th century that the brain was actually cellular 
they thought it was a continuous sub, uh, structure. But Cajal was able to show that the brain was made of individual neurons and every area of the brain had a specific structure. And that was a major finding. For neurosurgery, one of the biggest breakthroughs was the introduction of the CT scan. And I remember in the 70s as a student seeing the first brain scan, very blurry, but you could actually show that on x-ray you could see a clot inside the head, which no one could do before. And that transformed neurosurgery. And then came the MRI scan, which not only showed the interior of the um, skull showing the brain, it could actually show you structures within the brain substance. Today what we have with MRI scan using diffusion tensor imaging, mapping the flow of water in the brain, you can map out the axon co connectivity in the brain. You can use fMRI to look at brain function while the patient is awake. However, MRI scans have poor time resolution, only milliseconds. To get really rapid brain activation changes, we come to MEG scans. MEG scans can look at brain function in the, uh, a matter of microseconds. And by fusing it with the MR scan, we can arrive at an understanding of brain activation. And there's also PET scan. How did stereotaxy arise? Stereotaxy was first introduced to neuroscience by Sir Victor Horsley in 1907. He was a neurosurgeon in University College London, where I also studied. And he wanted to study the cerebellar function of the monkey brain. Conventionally, the only way to get at it would be to do a big craniotomy, destroy tissue to reach the cerebellum. But he wanted a way to destroy selective targets in the cerebellum without destroying brain tissue around it. So he had the idea that a monkey head is very irregular, like the human head. But if you bolt it, into a frame like this, then suddenly the irregular head becomes a bigger object inside a box. And in the box, you can measure side to side, front to back, and up and down. And what he did also was sanction monkey brains to create an atlas. And to center that atlas, he used the orbitomietal line as zero. And with that, he could map out any target in the monkey head and approach it with a needle and destroy it. But it was never thought to have any clinical use. My great interest has always been Parkinson's disease. It was first described exactly 200 years ago by James Parkinson in 1817. And interestingly, he called it the shaking palsy. But the problem was, in the 1800s, all tremulous disorders were considered the same disorder. Charcot, however, in the 1890s, was able to separate Parkinson's disease from the tremor of multiple sclerosis. Two ways. Parkinson's disease, patients who had tremor, rigidity, and slowness, and Charcot also added rigidity to the um, uh, symptoms, and renamed it Parkinson's disease. He was never able to demonstrate a pathology associated with Parkinson's disease. But the other tremulous disorder, multiple sclerosis, has plaques, which are signatory of the disease. And using an ostrich feather 
just a big feather, he was able to do his first experiments to separate the two diseases. If you have a Parkinsonian patient who's sitting still and you put a feather in his hand, it doesn't move. Um, it has a resting tremor, so it's shaking in his lap. But when he raises his hand, that tremor disappears. If you put a feather in the hand of a multiple sclerosis patient, their hand at rest doesn't move, but they have an intention tremor. So when they reach out, that tremor gets very bad. And by looking at that, he could separate the two patients. The substantia nigra was implicated in Parkinson's disease when it was found that a patient with a tuberculoma in the brainstem had all the symptoms and signs of Parkinson's disease. But then, of course, it was soon followed by the observation that there was a loss of pigmentation in the substantia nigra. But despite all that, there was no medical therapy for Parkinson's disease, except the fact that Charcot introduced belladonna. And again, that came to us through a very strange route. Charcot was a physician in Paris. And the dances in Paris of this uh, 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 hall called the Moulin Rouge, where they danced a lot, they wanted to make themselves more attractive to the male visitors. And so they asked him if they could give them eye drops. They would make their pupils dilate and so that they would look more appealing. So he gave them belladonna. But when he gave them belladonna, they came back to him and complained that their mouth was dry. Now Parkinson's disease, drooling is a big problem. And so he took that observation and gave Parkinson's patients belladonna, which controls atropine, and found that there was a benefit to the tremor. So belladonna was the only uh, way of treating Parkinson's disease at the time, despite all its nasty side effects. So if that was the best medicine could offer, could surgeons help? Now, surgeons and neurologists felt that because Parkinson's disease, if you look at it, is a tremulous disorder, the theory was you could excise parts of the nervous system and induce a partial paralysis which might help the patient. And so neurosurgeons tried excising the motor cortex to induce partial paralysis. They did dorsal rhizotomies to induce paralysis. The other uh, treatment was to do a pedunculotomy where they went under the temporal lobe and cut into the middle third of the cerebral peduncle. And then there was the, a, a, a a procedure uh, in the 1930s called chordotomy, where you do a cervical laminectomy and do an anterolateral chordotomy in the hope of inducing a paralysis that recovers and the tremor goes. I'll come back to that one. Whilst I was studying the nematode neuromuscular junction, I saw this video. No, it's not playing. Anyways, I saw a video of a thalamotomy, a very old one, where this patient with Parkinson's disease had an electrode passed to his brain and when the thalamus had a lesion made with uh, liquid nitrogen through a tube, the patient's tremor stopped. And that fascinated me, that one could destroy part of the brain and est establish normality, which was fascinating. And so I decided to go into medicine and do neurosurgery to study this procedure of thalamotomy. But what happened, 
Uh, so the videos aren't playing. You can watch the tremor. And you can see the tremor stops as the brain cools down. So that was the magic of this um, treatment. And that's what made me t go into neurosurgery. So, resuming again. Oh, I can't show that video. But what happened was... Huh? Presentation here. Good time. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. I can't play the video of this. But what happened was, by the time I qualified in medicine, Levodopa was introduced to Parkinson's disease. And for the first time, patients with one medication could lose their tremor, their rigidity, and slowness. And so functional neurosurgery, when um, uh, Levodopa was uh, widespread in the mid-70s, um, heralded the end of functional neurosurgery. It disappeared as a specialty. However, yeah, this doesn't work either. The problem with the levodopa was that after five years of treatment with levodopa, patients suffer extremely severe dyskinesias, thrashing movements. And by the time that was apparent, there was no way of improving the medical therapy because nobody understood the neural mechanisms of Parkinson's disease. However, what happened was Professor Langston described a series of patients that were introduced to him, severely akinetic, unable to move, young and healthy, as you can see. They did, he thought they were psychiatric patients and um, gave them antipsychotic anti treatment, but that didn't help. And then Dr. Davies, who's the psychiatrist looking after them, thought if the anti-psychiatric drugs don't help, could he help with levodopa? And when he gave these patients levodopa, they were totally normal. They got up and moved. And when one patient killed himself in a year's time, dissection of his brain showed the same changes that one sees in Parkinson's disease. And when they studied why these patients became Parkinsonian, it turned out that they were heroin addicts looking for a drug which was not regulated. And so they modified pethidine. And they created a drug called MPTP, which had the right effects of giving them the psychological highs, but made them very rapidly Parkinsonian. So for the first time, scientists have the possibility of inducing Parkinson's in an animal model, the monkey, to see what happens and whether you could study um, the mechanism of the disease. If you give a monkey MPTP, they became just like a Parkinsonian patient, unable to move, tremulous when they move, with poor balance and quite stiff if you examine their limbs. And this is what they look like when they're made severely Parkinsonian. And so people studied the Parkinsonian monkey brain in different ways. Professor DeLong looked at the uh, basal ganglia of monkeys using microelectrodes recording from single cells. Professor Alan Crossman in uh, Manchester was looking at monkeys using a totally different technique. 
giving them 2-deoxyglucose, which, which that was radioactive, and then using autoradiography, which was the precursor of PET scanning and all that, to look at which areas of the brain were overactive. Both lines of studies showed that the target in the brain, the subthalamic nucleus, was overactive in the Parkinsonian brain. So the two labs were very keen to look at what would happen if you lesioned the STM. Professor DeLong's lab was a neuroscientific lab and they looked at the effects of injecting a neurotoxin, ibotenic acid, into the uh, uh, STM to see if it affected the Parkinson's. And I was working with Alan Crossman and as a surgeon, I was interested in looking at whether we could use surgical tools to make lesions in the STN. What we found in both labs within months of each other was that if you took a Parkinsonian monkey like this and lesioned the subthalamic nucleus, as soon as it woke up, it was normal. So for the first time, you could reverse with the lesion, tremor, rigidity and slowness in the um, Parkinsonian monkey. However, neurologists were very afraid to refer patients for a subthalamic nucleus lesion because they knew that patients who have strokes in the subthalamic nucleus get severe thrashing hemichoria. Very soon after we published the effects of lesioning the STN, Ben Azuz, working in Grenoble in France, looked at an alternative to lesioning the STN. He looked at putting electrodes in the monkey brain when they're Parkinsonian and stimulating at very high frequency to give the nucleus a depolarization block. And he found that it had the same effect and proposed that deep brain stimulation of the subthalamic nucleus might be the way forward. Now, deep brain stimulation, we go back in time, it's not a new procedure. Going back to the 1950s, there was this um, uh, sur a surgeon scientist called Delgado, who felt that he could control the brain like an electrical machine by implanting electrodes that he could turn on and off. And this video doesn't play, unfortunately, but what it does show is that he was studying the aggressive fighting bull in France, in Spain. And he put electrodes stereotactically into the bull's caudate nucleus. And when the stimulator was off, the bull was ferocious and was chasing his student around the uh, arena. But at a distance, when he turned it on, suddenly this ferocious bull became very inactive and placid. So he could show that deep brain stimulation could control the brain and introduce the concept of deep brain stimulation um, to biology. Uh, where is that? So deep brain stimulation in the 1950s was quite a possibility but it was only confined to experimental situations because nothing was implantable. So patients would come to these scientific laboratories having electrodes put in different parts of the brain. The wire would be coming out and they would stimulate them for a period of weeks to see what effects they could get. So it was established that you could control motor deficits, um, uh, motor disorders with deep brain stimulation. You could control pain with deep brain stimulation and psychiatric disorders. So the indications were there, but the technology was not available. And it was in 1977 that deep brain stimulation was done with a fully implanted device by a British surgeon called Jason Bryce in a case of MS tremor, where they took a patient with severe MS tremor, in fact two of them, put electrodes in the motor thalamus and found on table that stimulation could stop the tremor and they fully implanted it, a very early Medtronic device. 
And in those days, the device was quite simple. Under the skin was just a coil embedded in acrylic connected to the deep brain electrode. And you had a stimulator outside the skin that could induce current in the coil and deliver stimulation to the brain. But the fact that lesion was so reliable, deep brain stimulation was not really that popular and took a long time to develop. And it was made popular in the mid to late 80s by the work of uh, Professor Benabit in France. He was able to show that deep brain stimulation of the VIM, the motor thalamus, could reliably stop tremor and with a fully implanted device stop it permanently. So deep brain stimulation started to catch on. And today, deep brain stimulation of the STN is the most commonly performed procedure for Parkinson's disease around the world. However, it's not the answer for all Parkinsonian patients. There are all Parkinsonian patients develop some difficulty with walking, initiating gait, and poor balance. And that was a subject of great interest to me. You see, when we looked at the subthalamic nucleus in monkeys, there was a change in a deep brain structure that when we lesioned the STN, inhibition using autoradiography was diminished in the peduncular pontine nucleus. And this is a cerebellar de decussation, so it's quite deep in the brain. But what did we know about this area? Well, the peduncular pontine nucleus degenerates in advanced Parkinson's disease, progressive supranuclear palsy, and multisystem atrophy. If you stimulate this area in the decerebrate cat, you can make it walk. If you stimulate it at a different frequency, you can make it even run. So this area was very central to movement, and that's why we were so interested. And so in Oxford, I recommenced my monkey work to look at the PPN. What we were able to show that if you lesion the PPN, the monkeys become slow bradykinesia and develop almost a hemi-Parkinsonian syndrome, which they recover from. And if you make bilateral lesions, they become totally unable to move. And if you increase the inhibition in the PPN by injecting muscimol, which is a GABA agonist, the monkey again becomes hemi-Parkinsonian. And this illustrates that effect. Muscimol makes them slower. By cuculin, which blocks GABA, makes the monkey more active. So what would happen if we manipulated the PPN in a Parkinsonian monkey? So this is a monkey that's made severely Parkinsonian. And when we injected by cuculin to block GABA input, the monkey was normalized. So it seemed that we could manipulate the brainstem in Parkinson's disease to help with gait and imbalance. But you can't inject uh, drugs in the human brainstem, so we looked at the possibility of deep brain stimulation. So here is a monkey. It's got custom-made very small electrodes in its peduncular pontine nucleus. This is the monkey before MPTP and after MPTP, and it's made very slow. We showed that high, low frequency can increase activity, and high frequency decreases it. And different low frequencies all show an increase in the activity of the monkey. Then the monkey, if we make Parkinsonian, you can see here, this is the monkey's normal activity. After MPTP, it's very slow. You give it levodopa, and it improves. You give it PPN stimulation, it improves a bit. You give them both together, and the monkey is normalized. So the PPN uh, was immediately caught upon 
as a target for surgery in Parkinson's disease in patients with mostly difficulty walking and balance. Uh, so what I will do is show you a slide separate to this. Yeah. This is a patient before uh, surgery and you can see his upper body is quite responsive to levodopa, but his walking is very difficult. He freezes in the door. <coughs> and he tries to turn around. And he's unable to do so. So we offered him pedunculopontine nucleus stimulation. And you can see that after stimulation of the PPN, his gait is normal. He can turn around comfortably. And his balance is good. And the question was, will this target sustain its effects over years? And this is him seven years after implant. And you can see that his Parkinson's uh, gate freezing and falls are still improved. So pedunculopontine nucleus is emerging as a further target for Parkinsonian gate freezing and falls. Uh, the numbers are still quite small because such cases are very few and far between with isolated gate freezing and falls with Parkinson's disease. So that's where Parkinson's disease and deep brain stimulation are today. If one were to offer deep brain stimulation to uh, someone with Parkinson's disease, you have to assess them quite carefully which we do in Oxford, because there are four different targets for deep brain stimulation. For isolated tremor, there are patients which, who in the old days would be called benign tremulous Parkinson's disease, where tremor is the predominant problem. And in those patients, you can stimulate the motor thalamus with good effect. There are patients who have tremor, rigidity, and bradykinesia, um, uh, that would respond to subthalamic nucleus because they're levodopa responsive but have run into dyskinetic disorders. We reserve subthalamic nucleus uh, stimulation for patients under 60 developing dyskinesias with tremor, rigidity, and bradykinesia, which are levodopa responsive. For patients who have been on levodopa for a very long time, but are still responsive and get dyskinesias. If you treat people who have been on levodopa for 15 to 20 years with STN stimulation, the requirement from the motor point of view drops, but these patients will become very depressed because they get Parkinsonian bradykinesia. And therefore we offer them palatal stimulation to get rid of the uh, dyskinesias so that they can continue their medication. And PPN stimulation we reserve for patients with gate freezing and falls which are levodopa resistant and there's no other treatment for it. So that's where we are with Parkinson's disease. Another aspect which interests me enormously is neuropathic pain. Deep brain stimulation for neuropathic pain is older than deep brain stimulation for movement disorders, but for some reason it had fallen out of practice because in the 1980s the Food and Drug Administration in the US withdrew funding for it because they felt there was lacking evidence, although there's a lot of case series. Deep brain stimulation was built around the work of this gentleman who's a good friend of mine, Don Richardson, working in Tulane in the US. This is my colleague, Alex Green, who's also a professor of neurosurgery in Oxford. 
what uh, Professor Richardson did was stimulate the sciatic nerve to induce a painful stimulus in the anesthetized cat while he's recording from the sensory thalamus. And if you stimulate them here, a painful stimulus, you record a slow wave potential in the sensory thalamus, indicative of a pain response. If you stimulate the spinal cord, that response is lost. If you uh, stimulate the upper brain stem, or as he called it, the uh, central gray area, you can block the response. And it is the same as morphine, which you know is an analgesic. And that led to him studying the effects of deep brain stimulation for pain in patients like this, which I described, where the electrodes are out of the patient's head for several weeks. This doesn't work either. But anyways, what he was able to also show, even in those days, that deep brain stimulation of the nucleus accumbens at the base of the forebrain could alleviate depression. So, how do we define neuropathic pain? The International Association for the Study of Pain defines pain now as pain caused by a lesion or disease of the somatosensory system. And if you look at deep brain stimulation today, you can see that it's used in movement disorders, depression, obsessive compulsive disorders, epilepsy, obesity, and of course, chronic pain. What it involves is putting these electrodes deep in whichever target you're going to work on, cables running under the skin, connected to a pacemaker under the skin, and you can use a hand controller to turn the stimulator on or off, an amplitude up or down. But the actual programming of the device in a more complex fashion has to be done by a clinician. How do we do the surgery? Well, you'll see some of it today. Um, brain imaging is done. We get the MR scan in detail before surgery. On the day of surgery, we put a frame to this uh, skull, and the patient has a CT scan. And then we merge the MR scan to the CT scan. So what happens is the scan is then put into space of the frame, and we can apply a target coordinate to any one part of the brain. And we can calculate where we want to enter the skull, and where we want to finish. In pain surgery, we do the operation under local anesthesia and pass the electrode to target and stimulate to make sure we get alleviation of pain. The electrode is passed down to a 2.5 millimeter twist drill in my hands, and then we implant the electrodes. And if we get the effect on table, we plate it to the skull. And in pain, we trial the patient for about a week to make sure they're happy. And then under general anesthesia, we put the rest of the implant in. The mechanisms of deep brain stimulation are still being worked out, whether it involves activation of one area and inhibition further down the line or the other way around is still not clear. The mechanisms probably depend on stimulation settings, whether it's in gray matter or fiber matter or a mixture and, of course, the anatomy of the targeted area. And what are the advantages of deep brain stimulation compared to lesioning? Well, it's reversible. If you're going to do a lesion, you have to be extremely good at examining a patient during surgery, knowing how big you're making a lesion, and when to stop to make sure you don't have side effects that can't be changed. On the other hand, a deep brain stimulation you, never destroys the tissue unless there's a hemorrhage. You can change the settings with time, if needs be. But what are the drawbacks? It's very expensive. And on a global market, although there's a steady increase in deep brain stimulation, it still remains the fact that many countries cannot afford it as the first-line treatment. And even in uh, 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 England, lesioning still is increasing for several reasons, not only cost. 
if you have a deep brain stimulator implanted, you, they're basically uh, signing up to lifetime follow-up by the surgical team and their neurology team because they'll have to make sure that the stimulator is still working years down the line, the battery is still full or needs replacement or that could change with recharging. And also patients dement with time with Parkinson's disease become too old to come to follow up. And increasingly in patients with problems, we do a lesion and take the stimulator out years down the line. The other problem is if it's a foreign body, it can get infected. Although MR compatible devices are coming out, patients may have MR scans for unrelated disorders without the stimulator being turned off safely and suffer brain damage. So those are the uh, um, disadvantages of deep brain stimulation. And for pain, the, the classical targets are the periventricular gray area, periaqueductal gray in the upper brainstem, and the sensory thalamus. And more recently, we're looking at the anterior cingulate. So I'll show you. Now this is an axial slice. The periventricular gray lies almost just lateral to the posterior commissure, uh, two to three millimeters from the uh, wall of the third ventricle. The sensory uh, thalamus lies more laterally, um, uh, 10 uh, to 15 lateral to the uh, uh, wall of the um, ventricle. And if you stimulate the periventricular periaqueductal gray area, and you're in the right area, patient's area of pain is replaced by a sensation of warmth. And if you stimulate in the a th sensory thalamus in the right area, the painful area feels a gentle buzzing or paresthesia, which blocks the pain. It's possible, we're not really sure how stimulation for pain works in the brain, but there is some work that we found that we can block the effects of uh, analgesia with periventricular gray stimulation with naloxone. So it may be that we in, um, cause the release of endogenous opiates. So the patients we take on are patients who've been refractory to pain medications for at least two years or cannot tolerate the drugs. They're usually referred to me by other pain physicians. We try to find an organic cause for pain in all these patients, make sure they're neuropsychologically stable, and they have no medical contraindications. So, we look back at 12 years of our practice. We initially assessed 197 patients, and for a number of reasons, Many patients did not get funding or refused to have surgery. 87 went on to have a trial. Not all reported success, and therefore 76 went on to full implantation, and 61 we were able to follow up long term. Because you lose follow up for various reasons. Patients move away without telling us, patients die, um, all sorts of things. And these are sort of patient assessments we do. We look at the VS score, we look at the McGill pain assessments in a very uh, standardized form. And if you look at the short-term outcome, whatever measure you look at across our pain patients, there is an improvement. Unlike Parkinson's disease, where there's a dramatic symptom reversal, you improve pain, you don't cure pain. That's the big difference. And even at long term, over four years, you get sustained improvement in pain. If you look at the causes of pain, most of the pain that we've treated have been stroke, but there have been other indications. Phantom limb, brachial plexus, spinal injury, strokes, head and neck pain, and other various sorts. And you can see some indications are better than others. Phantom limb is very responsive. You can see brachial plexus injuries get a, um, a, a reasonable response. And even stroke pain, we can achieve a good response with deep brain stimulation. 
So we do know that deep brain stimulation works well. Again, a video that didn't work, a video that didn't work. So the conclusion is that deep brain stimulation is effective in re um, uh, relieving neuropathic pain of certain uh, uh, etiologies and its efficacy is maintained. However, there are some patients with very widespread pain. If you look at some stroke patients, they have total hemibody pain. If you have a high cervical injury, you have whole body pain. And what can you do for that? For those patients, we looked at the anterior cingulate because of my experience and of many others that if you lesion the anterior cingulate in patients with terminal cancer pain, these patients enter a state where the pain doesn't bother them. But if you lesion the anterior cingulate in patients who are not terminal, after 10-12 months, the pain returns. But since you can vary stimulation with deep brain stimulation implanted, we looked at that as a target. And this is the area we implant the electrodes. The cingulate has been of interest to many people because it's part of the limbic system. It plays an important role in motor function and emotions. It receives projections from the amygdala and has diverse thalamic afferents. Cingulotomy, again, was a procedure that was introduced in Oxford in 1938 by Hugh Cairns and has been widespread um, use for pain since then. So what we looked at, given the other people's experience and my own, could we take away the suffering of pain? The pain will still be there, but the patient will not be bothered by it. So we looked at implanted anterior cingulate for pain. And this is a report of a series of 16 of our patients. And you can see where the electrodes are placed, coming deep into the frontal lobe to the end in the corpus callosum. And you can see again, looking at early outcomes, using various uh, uh, parameters, that we've improved the patient's situation from a pain point of view, and also quality of life and functional activity. And what do the patients report when you ask them? Well, this is the important thing. This is a patient, you can see the electrodes are externalized, so we're testing him. And what he says is, he still feels the pain, but he doesn't think about it anymore. And that is the great thing about anterior signal stimulation. And so in Oxford, we're running a study along that. The other thing we're interested in, <clears throat> does pain have a signature? Because pain is very subjective. And we want to find an objective sign of pain that we can qualitatively measure. And this is work of my colleague, Professor Alex Green, who shows that as the pain scores increase when you're recording from an electrode, you can see the activity changes. And typical of that activity change are these bursts of activity in the brain. You can also see that bursting. You can see the red denominates increased activity when you're recording from patients suffering an attack of cluster headache. And when patients have MEG scan in the pain state, you can see that there's an increased signal localized in that frequency around the sensory motor cortex and the cingulate. We've also shown that pain can be toxic. This is a volumetric study of the upper brainstem in pain patients. And patients with a lower McGill pain score have less atrophy than patients with severe pain. So pain can be toxic. We can't yet show whether that change in size is reversible with pain relief because it's hard, well, we can't scan patients with implanted electrodes. This was to show you the study where we could block the analgesic effect of deep brain stimulation with naloxone. 
We've also shown that the, there is a distinct connectivity in the brain uh, between patients who have successful anterior cingulate um, um, deep brain stimulation compared to those that ha have not. And what we found is that the precuneus in the back is the area that's most strongly connected to those who have pain relief. So, in the world of pain stimulation, we believe that single stimulation has a role to play. What we still have to work out is that when you stimulate that area for three to four years, some patients develop seizures. And what we're looking at is a way of stimulating that area and not inducing seizures. And what we see today, deep brain stimulation is used in tinnitus, eating disorders, drug addiction, autism, multiple sclerosis, depression, cluster headaches, epilepsy, Alzheimer's, chronic pain, of course, obsessive compulsive disorders, and Tourette's. Increasingly, many of these are being subject to trial. My colleague has also shown that you can control uh, a micturition in patients. You can delay bladder emptying by stimulating in the pedunculo pontine nucleus. And that might have a role in people with spinal injuries in uh, controlling um, unstable bladder function. And one of my PhD students has also shown that you can alter airways resistance with deep brain stimulation, which might be of use in patients with chronic airways disease. And certainly it has an effect on blood pressure. You can show the stimulation can change the parameters as we measure them. Now going back to what, how we do the uh, surgery, do we need a uh, microelectrode recording? If you go through time at the scans that were used in the past, look at what you got, a one and a half Tesla, three Tesla, and then you go on from that, and look at seven Tesla scans. You see, the targets are so well delineated. And with diffusion tensor imaging, you can map out where these areas project. That increasingly, the method of surgery for functional surgery is becoming simpler. Not only do, uh, are there increasing uh, reports of not using MER, there are even reports now of not keeping the patient awake. So fully implanted surgery without MER, without patient awake, is becoming increasingly popular. And what we're seeing is a revolution, perhaps, in the way the surgery is performed. And from a technology side, we'll see the batteries will have longer life, be rechargeable, smaller size. We can see a day when we can implant the tiny pacemakers in the skull. They might be flexible, so you can shape it. And of course, we're looking for MR capability. We can also change the way we can stimulate patients. We can use multiple electrodes, as you can see here, to change the shape from just a ball, as we see it, to any shape or form we want, using more and more contacts. So electrodes are coming out these days with split contacts, so you can deliver current in any direction you want. Another thing is using the brain signal itself to control the pacemaker. And this is work that we've done. Showing, this is continuous stimulation as we do today. This is stimulation delivered only in response to beta oscillation, which is a signature of Parkinson's disease, and random stimulation. And you can see that stimulation delivered only in response to the symptom, the beta oscillation, seems to have better control of the Parkinson's disease than continuous stim. And in the future, we'll also see a change in programming. In the past, it was trial and error looking at four contacts and seeing whether the patient got better. Programming will be more difficult with multiple contacts. 
And so we'll have to look at a new way of programming. And it will be probably visual. So we look at the computer showing us the shape, calculated shape of the uh, stimulation field rather than us just guessworking. And in the future, well, this is interesting because the PINS device meets this criteria. If we can stimulate and program a patient at a distance, hundreds of miles away, it would make it easier to follow up our patients and can um, uh, manage them uh, from around the world. We could probably even record signals from the stimulator themselves. For, from a global health point of view, we need to train more people. We need to establish centers, make the treatment affordable, give centers the skills to either lesion or stimulate to benefit as many people as we can, make the stimulators simpler. And as I keep talking about, lesional surgery will always have a place. I'm sorry the videos didn't work, and I'd like to thank you for listening to me. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Yeah. Thank you, sir, for your nice lecture. Uh, in the indication list, you showed the autism is one of the indication of uh, deep brain stimulation. How it works in uh, autistic people? There's only one uh, center that is offering that, and it's in. I remember South America. Um, it's reported, but um, the outcomes aren't clear. Um, what he has done is put electrodes in multiple targets. And as I understand it, the amygdala is one of the targets. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you very much, and um, hopefully you'll be able to see a surgery um, in a short while. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Professor Tipologis, for his excellent and informative presentation. Uh, we have one case uh, selected for uh, deep vein stimulation today. The case is presented by Professor Selim Shahi. Acid Professor of Neurosurgery, Acid Professor of Neurology, National Institute of Neuroscience. Now we requested Dr. Selim Shai, Acid Professor of Neurology, to present the case. Assalamu alaikum and very good morning, respected learned audience, our teachers, our foreign faculty, Professor Tipu Aziz, and my dear colleagues from different institute working at different faculty relevant to movement disorder and Parkinson's disease. I am Dr. Selim Shahi, ASU Professor of Neurology working at National Institute of Neuroscience. This is our great pleasure to attend such type of live workshop organized by Society of Neurosurgeons of Bangladesh and also co-organized by Society of Neurologists Bangladesh Movement Disorder Society and also United International University and National Institute of Neuroscience. I would like to present before the larger audience very briefly our today's proposed case for DBS surgery. an elderly man with disabling tremor. Mr. Major retired Kaikubath, who is 65 years, hypertensive, non-diabetic, right-handed person, a son of non-consanguous parents, who is suffering from tremulous movements on left half of body for last six years and frequent fall for last six months. He attended our different neurology consultants in different years. 
but he was relatively well six years back when he noticed tremulous movement on left half of body that started from left upper limb followed by left lower limb, which was insidious onset and gradually progressive. He also noticed the development of mild tremulous movement on his right side for the last one years. Patient gave the history of frequent fall last six months for which he felt difficulty in walking and activity in daily living. He consulted with neurologists and they suggested him to take levodopa as well as anticholinergics followed by dopa agonist in optimal dose but he complains of no significant improvement of his disabling tremor. Although he gave history of uh, some improvement in his body kinesia and rigidity. No other family members uh, suffering from such type of illness. He had a history of cardiac bypass surgery on 2007, but he gives no history of stroke, encephalitis, or head injury. He denies to take any antipsychotic drugs for the last years. He was referred by our renowned professor, our honorable director, Professor Kajidin Mahmoussar, to the movement disorder and DBS clinic at National Institute, National Institute of Neuroscience Hospital for further evaluation and for plan of DBS surgery. We evaluated him thoroughly and we found uh, that his general examination was apparently normal, but neurological assessment revealed there is mast faces with indistinct speech. There was rest tremor with bradykinesia and rigidity, which was more marked on left side of his body with slow shuffle gait and positive retropulsion uh, uh, with glabular tape. Here we are showing some maneuver for to show the resting tremor, rigidity, and body kinesia. Sorry, we could we uh, could not show all the maneuver due to some mechanical error. So, according to the our UK Parkinson's disease brain bank clinical diagnostic criteria, we diagnosed him as a case of Parkinson's disease with disabling medical resistant, med disabling medication resistant tremor. That's why we primarily selected him for DBS surgery according to the selection criteria of DBS surgery as we know and we already Professor Tipu Aziz sir discussed about indication of DBS surgery. Here we, we are presenting this case before our learned professors for your valuable and final comment about DBS surgery of this patient. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Th thank you, Dr. Selim Shahi, Associate Professor of Neurology, for his excellent presentation. Now, his audience is open for discussion, so there is no discussion. Now, I request Professor Tipu Ajis, founder and head of Oxford Function Neurosurgery to say some things about the case. So, there, this is a gentleman with drug resistant tremor worse on the left with improvement in his uh, gait, bradykinesia and rigidity with levodopa. His right tremor is barely noticeable. He's got severe left-sided tremor. So what do we offer him? When you speak to him, 
All he wants is improvement of his left-sided tremor. And we can do that with a, a right-sided VIM stimulation. The reason I've chosen the thalamus is that if someone is most concerned with tremor, there's no better target than the VIM nucleus to abolish tremor. The STN can, but is not as good, and the pallidum is even less so. Therefore, that is what you'll see happening to him today. And just, I can't prove it statistically, but it is true that Parkinson's, among those of us of the Indian subcontinent, is quite different to the Parkinson's with disease we see in the West. Parkinson's disease, as it affects the Indian folks, is largely tremor dominant, rapid onset of drug intolerance, with severe dyskinesias. And also, it's my feeling over the last 30 years of operating that the subthalamic nucleus is not as potent a target in the Indian uh, population as it is in uh, others. And therefore, I target um, such patients with symptom-specific targets. His is tremor, we're going for the thalamus. He complains of left side, we'll do the right thalamus. And that's what we'll do, see today. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tisipai, sir. Uh, now, uh, we have started the case. We will we'll start the case. And, uh, we also give thanks to PINS for its logistic supports. Now, thank you, audience, and enjoy the case. <laughs>